Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool pinball repair video for you this evening. We have been working on this Gottlieb Shipmates pinball machine uh, that someone brought us and wanted us to fix up for him. So we did a video uh, painting it. We did a video uh, uh, doing the play field. We did a video working through some of the electromechanical parts inside. And now we are kind of up to... Uh, we need to finish up the underside of the playfield. We haven't messed with that much yet. And then we need to install the beautiful back glass that we've ordered uh, in the back of the machine. So, we're almost there. We've got this thing working, uh, but and it's scoring, but it's not perfect. So, it's, it's still got some issues. So, I'm going to lift up the playfield, and we need to work on it, and we need to work on the roto target a little bit. We haven't really... Um, we haven't really messed with it at all yet, and it's, you know, kind of the main feature of the machine. Uh, so let me lift up the play field. We'll start working under there, see if we can finish up all of the things that we haven't cleaned and adjusted yet, and then we'll troubleshoot it. All right, folks, I have went through and cleaned all the switches. Nothing of consequence happened, so I didn't film any of it. None of them were messed up. The only thing that's a little iffy is this pop bumper has locked on at some point. So is that thing fried? Eh, the papers kind of burn up. We'll have to test it to see if it's fried. So there's really only two other things under here that I need to worry about. One is the famous roto target. We're going to save it for last. It's a little sticky. It's not that great. Okay, and then the other thing is all of these light bulbs. If you saw it the, on the top, uh, a lot of them weren't lighting up very well, but it's because they're all old and filthy. So they've created all kinds of dust and uh, uh, soot and all of that. So I'm going to go through and take them out one at a time, clean the little lens from the bottom to get all the soot out, and then put a new one in. So that usually takes about 45 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to go through and get those all out of the way, and then we'll mess with the Roto Target, which is actually a very simple design, but we need to repaint parts of it too. See how it's all worn? So I got to paint that to make the uh, the top of the play field look a little better. All right, so I got all of the light bulbs working except for two of them. Whenever we hit the uh, one point, you'll see this one go off, and that one come on, and this one go off, and that one come on, and this one come off, and that one come on. Notice, too, whenever the alternating relay bounces back and forth, that doesn't make the horrible buzzing noise that it was making on the previous video. So that one, that one, and that one. And then I lit all the other ones by just hitting switches on the play field. So, for instance, that one's lit up. But if you hit this one, that one's lit up, that one's lit up. So all of that is working. Um, also, the shoot again one is working. Everything's working, except there's three problems. The two pop, the two uh, kicker ones are not lit up. I don't know how to light them up, or they're messed up. And this coil is absolutely screwed up. If I hit it, this left bumper relay starts smoking. The switch up here, which is the one that connects to that, is all <laughs> literally smoke coming out of it. So that's not good. We're going to figure out what that's all about. So we got that to work on. We've got those two lights and the uh, the um, roto target. So first, let's see what lights up those two lights. All right, so if we look at the schematics, these are the original schematics that came with the game. We've taped them back together. They're old. If you want a new set of schematics for your game, go to Pinball Resource, the Pinball Resource, pbresource.com. Uh, they make really nice copies of these, and these Gottlieb ones are actually licensed, so you can get a nice licensed copy, full size, that you can use like we're using here if you would like one. Uh, pbresource.com. Um, by the way, I don't have any business relationship with them or anything. I just buy stuff from them all the time, and I like what they're doing. Okay, so here are a lot of the light bulbs on the play field. Now, if you look, uh, the on pop, bumpers, on pop bumpers green light, that's on. The right bottom rollover light, that's on. The right kicking hole light, that's on. The left kicking rubber light is the one that we're worried about. But I also noticed that the left pop bumper and the bottom pop bumper are also not lighting. And then on, so is this thing working? Yes, this must be working 
because these lights are working at least, okay? But these are not, which is the J relay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So maybe we haven't done whatever it takes to turn on the J relay. Um, and then if it switches over to here, then you should have the off pop bumpers red light, which is there. There must be a button to turn them off or something. Oh, you know what it is? It's that swinging target in the middle, I'll bet. Mm, we'll get to that. It's the left bottom rollover light. So this one lights up. The left bottom rollover light lights up. The left kicking hole light lights up. But the right kicking rubber light does not light up. The right pop bumper light does not work up. And the top pop bumper light does not light up. So it looks like you turn on J. And that makes the pop bumpers light up. And that one that we're talking about. So I must have not turned on J yet. So let's see how do we turn on J. So here is J. And then here is J. I guess that turns it off, right? So those two work in tandem. Um, and they are one or the other hits depending on what position A1 is in. We went over that a little bit um, in the previous video. And then they are turned on by L. So what is L? That's the roll under relay. So yeah, it's that little target on the play field. If you roll one way, it turns it on. If you roll it the other way, it turns it off. So uh, it's probably set on turned off right now. Um, so I'll have to... And those are latching relays. So I'll have to go hit that and see if it turns all that stuff on. All right, so that one was kind of tough to figure out. This is the J relay and the J reset relay. So the problem was... And we messed with that earlier. Uh, the problem was it didn't... It would reset and do this. So that's reset, but it wouldn't latch. So that's latched. Reset, latched. And if you watched the previous video, we had a problem with one of the switches over there. Well, the issue on the whole thing was this entire uh, plate was bent. If you looked at it, it was just bent a little bit. So it's on the bottom, something that hit it at some point. Somebody may have dropped the play field or something, I don't know. So I just kind of strong-armed it and bend it back. The reason that that was a problem was because since it was bent, this plate, once it latched, like that, or no, I had it the wrong way. Once it reset like that, it was bent that way so that it made this plate longer so whenever this pulled in the reset plate wouldn't slide past it so I'll show it, show it to you from another angle this is the kind of stuff you can't really you know teach about you just find it and go huh that's interesting so we had the same problem in the previous video where these wires wouldn't stay out of the way so do you see how the two plates meet Right. So see, they're right next to each other. And so when this one pulls in, the plate has to slide past it. See how it's not touching it? Well, now it's stuck behind it, so this is latched on. So whenever it resets, it works the opposite way. The plate slides past the end, and now that plate has slid past that. It's just the typical latching relay. But it wasn't working properly because this entire plate was all bent up. So when I bent it back straight, now they move with the proper clearance and all of that. So I'm gonna recheck all of these switches to make sure that they're still adjusted right after bending everything. And then we'll test, I think that will give us our pop bumper lights back. So the way it works is see that green light there? It says pop bumpers. And so if the red one's lit, when you roll under the gate here, it hits this spring, which we don't have attached yet because we had to buy one. It was missing. It hits that spring, which pulls up on a switch underneath and either resets the pop bumper relays, which is that J one that we were just looking at, or turns them on. So right now we're reset. If I pull up on this spring, it will connect that switch, which should turn on this. And it did. Okay. And now we've got one of our lights back. 
So if we alternate to the other side by getting one point, oh, that one's going to give me 10 points, actually. Well, maybe 10 points will do it. No, it's got to be the one point. Please don't bite my finger, Mr. Mr. Kicker. <laughs> did it do it? It did do it. Cool. All right, so that's that. So what about the pop bumpers? The top one and the left one are lit. And now the bottom one's lit. Didn't the left one light up for a second there? Well, that's the one we're having all kinds of problems out of, isn't it? So the left pop bumper's tripping a little bit. We got to mess with that whole thing. We're, we might have to. We're going to, have to do some serious swappage on it. Okay. So first thing I think I'll do is I'm going to lay the playfield down and hook up that little spring. Okay. So I got the little spring hooked up. That was missing. So I got a new one. Put it in. And so whenever that t that swings, it will lift that spring just a little bit. And that's just how they did them on the old ones. They call that a roll under switch as opposed to a roll over switch. So it's supposed to be that pop bumper and this pop bumper. I took this off. The bulb is new. Everything looks cool from the top. There must be something going on. But this is the same one that's all fried and screwed up. Okay. Um, so uh, if I swing under... Or if I get 10 points, it should go back over to off. Or one point, one point. Yes. So not only are we on off now, but those two are lit. Now if we did it again, it would go back to on, and those two would be lit. And it just keeps doing that, keeps doing that. And there are 10 points if lit, one point if not lit. Um, I would hit it, but that one relay is screwing up because it doesn't want to turn on this pop bumper coil. Okay, so now that it's off, if I hit that, it should turn all the pop bumpers off. And it did. So we are good. Um, if we alternate back, now if I hit it, it should turn them back on. And you can go either way through it. Bam! Oh, that's a good, that's an easy way to switch back and forth. Starting to get there, people. It's starting to get there. Okay, so we really need to mess with this left pop bumper. We still need to do the roto target, and then there's other various things. But uh, I think we've got the ones down here fixed, and we've got the lights that weren't working up here fixed. We got that mounted. We're getting there. All right, so here's the pop bumper. See the left pop bumper and then under it the bottom pop bumper? If you come over this way, you see that both of them are turned on by the F relay. That's the left pop bumper relay. So whenever I hit it, uh, this switch sparks. Now, why would it do that? It's because if this coil is shorted, you are connecting neutral to hot just pss, 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 and it'll spark like crap so this coil is probably shorted but we can check it if you look on the left it's connected to the common the neutral and on the right it's not connected to anything other than that switch so if the switch isn't closed connecting from this lug to this checking from this lug to this lug is the same as just you can check it in circuit is what I mean because that right side isn't hooked to anything so we'll check it with a multimeter if you're down below about two ohms it's shorted and you need to replace it. Why would it short? It must have locked on. If the little skirt gets stuck or something where the switch is always on, then that relay is always on, which makes that always on, which will burn it up. It should just connect until it pulls in and opens that other switch, which will kill that F relay. So uh, we're going to check across this pop bumper coil. So here is our suspect. So if this pulls in, it directly connects the hot to the neutral. Oh look, the wire just broke off. Well, that's good. Make it easier to me, for me to swap. Probably because it got so hot. 
it developed a, would you call that a cold solder joint or a hot solder joint? 0.3 ohms resistance. 0.2 across that coil. That thing is shish kebobbed. I would ask you. It broke. Uh, I didn't even have to ask him, but he did it. Oh. Okay, so if I do this side with my chopsticks, 1.9 or 2. So we're right there. It's good. So basically what's going on is there is a wire that's really long that's wrapped around there, and this is the other end of the wire. Well, the wire has resistance in it. When you run power through it, it makes that a magnet, which pulls the little metal slug into it. But if you get it really hot, what happens is the coating on, on the wire melts off. And then, since it's all wrapped around itself, laying right on top of itself, if the, co if the coating melts, now you've got bare wire touching bare wire, and it makes the wire not as long. So you have almost a direct short across the two lines. So then, since there's no load there, whenever it, the relay here connects ground and hot together, you don't have the coil in the way. You're just directly connecting the wires together, and that's why it sparks. So that one is fried. It's shish kebab. we got to swap it out. All right, I looked through my part stash, and I had another one that's good. It's an original one, uh, but the paper was ripped a little bit, so I put some electrical tape over the paper, right? But it's a good coil. Um, you know, I guess it mounts like this, though, wasn't it? Wasn't that how it was? Uh, and if you look, this is why the light's not lighting up. This is the original wire that goes to the little thing over there, and they have some, for some reason, put a little jumper on it and then had it twisted together and it wasn't connected. So I need to fix that while I have the soldering iron out, wiring this back up. All right, it's back in there. The light works. Perfect. Perfect. And it's given 10 points like it's supposed to. Very cool. Okay, so now we need to do the... The uh, Roto Target. Gottlieb's famous Roto Target. This thing is really cool. So basically, depending on what you hit on the play field, this thing spins around and lands on a number of some sort. So a three is up there right now. And then if you hit that number, it hits a switch behind it, and you win three points. Now if you've got the ten times light lit up, you win 30 points. And if you've got the hundred times light lit up, you win 300 points. So it's kind of cool. This And they, make, they made all different versions of it with all different numbers and all this stuff, right? So this one just says one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, over and over again. So one thing we need to do is take that off and repaint it where it's all worn. And we need to make sure that it works right. I don't think right now that it does. Let me see, how do we actually spin it? It looks like if you land in there, it spins it. So I'm going to try not to get my finger hit by this or that. <laughs> so that's just moving a little bit. That's not how a roto target's supposed to roto target, okay? That thing's supposed to spin around like a third of the way. So, um, it's just, it's not working right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take that thing off. Um, I'm trying to decide. I don't believe there's nothing on the back. Yeah. There's no, there's no switch or anything on the back, okay? Which means that it doesn't really matter where you put it back on the front. You don't have to line it up or anything, because it's just going to spin around and not be lined up anyway. Okay, so um, let me take that loose by simply taking those three screws off. Of course, I'm going to... Uh, look how they've got it adjusted to one end, too. We'll change that, probably. Uh, of course, I'm going to turn it off first so we don't get electro-killed. Alright, so taking that off. Obviously, this board, you can tell what to do with it. Just clean up the rivets. 
and we use a little dielectric grease which allows it to spin better uh, basically you've got friction of the little fingers that point on the board um, they are fixed on that wheel so whatever is up the little fingers on the board will be shorting some of these contacts and that's how the board can tell uh, what number it is if it's the three the two the one whatever now um, the the way this works is whenever this pulls in there are two ratchets I guess that's a ratchet and there are two little actuators here there's one here and then one just like it backwards behind it on that gear now you see one of the gears aims one way and the other aims the other way so when this pushes in the back one is pushing down on one of the gears see it over there on the left now see how that's letting it go backwards it shouldn't be doing that it should be when it pull when it pushes in Spins that thing wildly to the left. So what allows it to go backwards? Well, this is supposed to catch it. So when that goes down, it moves it out of the way. Let me use my pinky. <laughs> it moves it out. Let me use my ring finger. It moves it out of the... That didn't work. It moves it out of the way which allows this to just spin and spin and spin and spin and spin like that right so why isn't it it's because when it comes back to about right here it's catching it this is going under that lip and then pulling it backwards it shouldn't do that I think the problem is this is adjusted wrong see how that has a little slanted piece there that's so that whenever the thing goes down, it hits the side of that and then pushes out so that it's away from the gear. They've got it way over that way, which is not allowing it to work properly. Because basically as soon as it goes in, yeah, there's enough room for that to spin past it, but just barely. So as soon as it comes back up, it's going to stop it from turning and then it's going to push it backwards and sometimes it's doing it so much that it has inertia to push it even farther so there should be an adjustment on this to bring it back this way someone has adjusted it way too far that way um, and then also the thing could use oiled so I'm going to take this little stud off here this boss I think I like to call that <laughs> I'm going to take this ball saw here and uh, oil that a little bit. If I take out the gear on the bottom, uh, maybe we can see better how to adjust that little bracket too. All right, so I went and found the adjustment procedure. Okay, and I show you where the paws should be. And on ours, our stop paw, the front one, this is worn a little bit right on the edge. But you see how they have it back pretty far, actually. So it's actually in the right spot. So I was thinking that that wear would mess it up, but not really, because the wear where it hits the gear, when it goes down, this hits a different part of this paw. So the wear where it's on the gear constantly. So basically the gear is spinning quicker, you know, and trying to drag against it and stuff. It's almost got like a saw blade action on it it doesn't on this part so it's not worn where it hits this and since the whole purpose of it is you're trying to get that away from the gear as it spins by it's irrelevant really if there's wear there okay so it's actually adjusted properly so I dropped some oil uh, on the shaft I took the little uh, what they're calling a what did they call it they call it the mounting spider I call it a boss I took that off dropped some oil down the shaft it was kind of rusty looking and now it looks a lot better so you can see it's actually lined up pretty much how they had it in the diagram 
you're supposed to measure between the blade well I don't know maybe that is a little off you're supposed to measure between here and here. That's supposed to be 3.30 seconds. That's, that looks that looks larger to me. Let me go measure that. Well, it's not supposed to be 3.30 seconds. It's supposed to be 3.16. And that is right at 3.16. So it's proper. So oiling the shaft. Now it does this. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so I want to look up something in the schematics just to make all this interesting. If you do this really quick, I mean, it still does pretty good now that I've got it oiled, but if it were to hold in a little bit, it goes farther. So how long should it hold in? This is like one of the most interesting, deep, nerdy parts of uh, EM pinball repair. So here is the roto unit. That is the coil that pulls in. If that pulls in really quick, the roto target will only spin just a little bit. But if it pulls in and stays in, that one stop pawl stays out of the way, which allows it to spin a little farther. Okay. So how long do they do they energize that? There's actually a design to it. Okay. So that will stay on as long as the L, O, or P relay is closed. Uh, and motor 3E has not opened yet, okay? So L, O, or P are what spin it. All right, L, O, and P, all three, turn on the score motor. The score motor turns one uh, revolution from home position to home position every time it turns on because this switch on itself holds itself on until it gets back to a home position, okay? So if you look at the motor over here, see these three little divots? The motor is divided into thirds, the score motor, and when it turns, once it starts, so any of those relays, if they start that sucker turning, it immediately closes a switch on itself, and it will turn until it gets to its next home position, and then that switch opens and it will stop if the relay that turned it on or some other relay hasn't turned it back on. So it may turn a little bit, and then that turns another relay on, which allows it to move past its next home position. But as long as all of the relays turn off, it will stop at its next home position, okay? And there is actually a, uh, well, I wonder if this one has the timing on it. I guess that's what this is. Hmm, okay. Yeah, hmm, that doesn't actually, this doesn't actually tell us. Hmm, on the newer ones it tells us. Let me see if I can figure it out. Okay, so here's the confusing part. This is drawn in such a way that it's hard to tell what's happening here. This one right here, this is a hole in the plate of the metal that has been bent up to here to hold the switches for one. So the switches on, on one actually go this way. So switch 1C sticks over here this way. The head of the switch will be right here and it mounts right here. Okay, this is a drawing of the side of it. See how it's folded up? Basically, it's a piece of the metal that's folded up. And C is on that top plate. The bottom plate is the impulse plate. It has five bumps each home position. The top plate has one hole at each home position. So basically, switch 1C opens at the home position. This is drawn on the home position. There's a switch right here that is open because it has fallen down into that hole. Okay, that's the one that turns on the motor. As soon as this starts turning, uh, it will close that switch, which will make the motor run until that switch falls open when this uh, little uh, hole over here gets over to here, right? So that's how that works. So we need to see which ones are, which ones will turn off that roto target. L, O, and P are what turn it on. So P, for instance, if it were to pull in, P 
he is the 50 point relay. The 50 point relay apparently um, turns the roto target. There is O. O is the five point relay. So if you get five points or 50 points, and they've probably just got the, the play field set up where whatever you earn five points on says and rotates roto target or something like that, right? So the five or the 50 they have set up to rotate the roto target. So how long does the P relay and the O relay stay on for? Well, whenever they turn on, it will lock itself on with a switch on itself until motor 2B opens. So at home position, 2B is closed. Eventually that's going to open. Okay, and then O locks itself on through the same uh, wiring. So motor 2B, so there is a switch mounted here on number 2 that points this way. Right? And so it's over here and it's closed. Well, see these little shafts drawn here? That's B. So these little shafts hanging down are what hit it. So I would imagine, although I can't completely tell here, that that is one, that is one, and that is one. So that one, that one, and that one. We are ignoring this one, this one, and uh, this one, which are above it. They should have probably drew that a little better, but if you look, there's three triangles, two triangles. So that's the ones on the top, that's the ones on the bottom. Okay, so if it's closed at 2B, that switch only sticks out to about here. So I believe that would actually be closed because of that. So as soon as this turns a little bit, that's going to open up. So in other words, that roto target is not going to be on long. It's just going to pull in just for a little bit because almost immediately when this starts turning, that switch is going to open to turn off the L, the O, or the P um, that are what's sticking the roto target on. So probably not for long. Now there's a way we can test it. We could just hit something that spins the roto target and see how long it stays in. But it's just, this stuff's interesting to me. On the newer machines, they actually have a diagram where they show you where things hit and how, how uh, long it's held on and all of this. So it's kind of cool. But uh, they hadn't done it yet on uh, Shipmates. All right, so according to the play field, there are three ways to spin the roto target. That's to land in this eject hole, that eject hole, or to hit the roll under switch that we were messing with, right? So one of those three will spin it. So I'll hit that and we'll just see how well it spins without the little disc on it. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Did you see how far that, that spun? So you can see just how cool of a little effect this is going to be once we get it all working properly. You can also see with the wheel removed that it's really a simple device. There's only one switch. So when you hit the plate, all it does is whichever plate is in the middle just happens to be the one that hits the switch. So once it rotates to the number two, that two will be up and when you hit it, it just hits the same switch. And the switch is just wired into all of these rivets. Uh, and so the little fingers that move around, they're on one of these uh, places and will either score one, two, or three, depending on what they're touching. Now, you can also see that they could have made it super complex. The thing's got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. I think fifteen positions, it looks like. So they could have fifteen different awards because they have fifteen sets of rivets. So depending on how complex they want to make it, they could have that thing where every one of those fifteen uh, uh, little targets scores different. I guess eventually, though, you would run out of things to score. You can score one point 
five points, ten points, fifty points, a hundred points. So on this one, they the way they have worked around that is they've done the one time, two time, I mean one time, ten time, a hundred time thing, which is good enough. Plus, you don't want to make the rules like so complex that people don't even understand what the hell's going on, right? I'm almost there right now, but you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, so if you make it where, okay, you hit the number, it's one, two, or three, and then you multiply it by 10 if it says 10, or 100 if it says 100. That's real simple. That's a fun gameplay mechanic. Um, so let's see how long that thing actually pulls in. We'll focus on that since we saw that it spins well. How long does it need to make it spin like that? It does spin, it does hold in a while. Okay, and then you can see down here what's going on. <laughs> and it just it all works in concert you know what I mean you got to have that right you got to have the that right you got to have this right and if you got it all right happy happy time so here is the wheel itself you can see that all these little blades are riveted on I've had these break before and uh, you just kind of got to glue them back or weld them back JB weld something if you've got the piece if you don't have the piece well then you're kind of in trouble um, but they made a bunch of these so I'm sure you could find one so I'm gonna straighten all of these so that they're like you know this one looks right but that one looks bent I'm just gonna go in by hand and bend them as best as I can um, you can see too that you can't really take it off because it's riveted on so you got to watch how you bend it if you get it too mangled you're never going to get it straight but I'm going to do that I'm going to bend them all as straight as I can get them and then I'm going to clean each one of them you just see the wear some worse than others which is interesting like why is that one so much worse than that one how's it Look at that one compared to the one right next to it. How's that possible? It must have landed on that more often, and you saw, just by just looking at it, that it's completely random. So if it's random, how does it land on that one most of the time? It might be rigged, people. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to clean all of these with a magic eraser, just lightly, just to clean off all of the dirt that I can, because I'm try what I'm going to try to do is save all the original paint and just paint a little white and the black back in. I'm not going to repaint the whole thing. You know. um, they make stickers you can put on them, but nah, who wants a sticker? I want the original paint. You can see the difference. Getting there. Okay, so I have got out a bunch of different colors of white paint, and the closest to it is warm white. Okay, now I put a little bit on there, and it's not quite right. It's a little bit off. And if you look, it's, this, is, this is like super hard to tell, but I'll just tell you and you tell me what you think. If you're good at color matching, so this is the warm white, and this is the, the original white. The difference between that color and that color is that that color is a little bit more red than this color and this color is a little bit more green than that color it's hard to see that that is super delicate <laughs> now if you put a cool white which is this it's hard to see but the cool white is a little bit too blue it's hard to I mean like I said that's just hard to notice I can understand if people can't so cool white won't work. It's a little bit too blue. But to my eye, I can see that this is slightly more green than that. And that is slightly more red than that. But you're talking barely. You would be fine if you just painted this in. Because it's close. But it's not right. <laughs> you can see it's just off just barely. So I'm going to attempt to put the smallest little dab of something green in there to maybe green it up just slightly. 
but whenever you're mixing white, it's so hard to do because just a little tiny bit of any kind of other pigment will really skew it one way or the other. So it literally might be you take like a the end of the paint stick and touch something, touch the green paint with it and then mix it into the white paint. You don't want much. All right, folks, so whenever I do black ink, I use these Posca water-based paint markers. This is what you want. You don't want to use a Sharpie. Sharpies are great. I think they're made in the USA too, by the way. I like Sharpie. This is the wrong thing for Sharpie because here's what's going to happen. If you just paint it with a Sharpie, when the ball hits it, it's going to chip it off. So the solution to that is you need to clear coat it. Once you put a clear coat on it, you're going to thicken up the paint where whenever the ball hits it, it won't knock it off. But you can't really clear coat a Sharpie. If you do that, Sharpie is made of magical material. And it starts running because the acetone or whatever the crap it is in uh, spray paint interacts with whatever the crap it is in the Sharpie. And they don't like each other. And they fight all over your artwork. So you don't want to do that. So just get some Posca, some water-based ones, or, or water-based ones that you like. But they need to be water-based. When you clear over acrylic paint, water-based paint, it doesn't run. It stays where it is. Now, if you want some of those actual Poscas, if you want these same ones that I'm messing with, um, we have them on our website. Go to lionsarcade.com. I can get my paint pen to work. Go to lionsarcade.com. Go to lionsarcade.com and we have a parts page. And on our parts page, we have a bunch of links to things like this. Now, you can do these as nice as you want them. If you don't like the way I'm doing them, do yours better. Um, one of the things though is now I need to touch that one because I just, you know I'm left hand. I should have been doing it that way. Let's start with this one. Uh, with the backhand curve there, you saw that. Some you know what I'm talking about. freehand them and by the way on one like this you can freehand the hell out of it because you can't see more than one number at a time how can they compare your three to the other three if they can only see the one three okay so white didn't come out perfect the black isn't perfect but I think it looks pretty good it looks a heck of a lot better than it did so I'm gonna clear it let it dry and then we'll put it back in the machine Go to lionsarcade.com to the parts page and you can see the clear we use, the pins we use, all that stuff. So go check it out. And also, make sure to pick up one of our t-shirts while you're there. Much nicer. Boy, it looks great, doesn't it? That's like the best one that was still on there, though. So we'll have to rotate it to see what some of the other ones look like. So that's two. Times one. If I hit this, it should light 10 and give me 20 points. It gave me 20 and it, light, it lit 10, so now I should get 20. How cool is that? Now if I hit this little one, and by the way, it is supposed to be little like that. The three targets are supposed to be completely different. It's now lit 100, so I should get 200. That's how you do it, folks. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's three. Perfect. How cool is that? 
Nothing like a nice roto target. Yeah, that's awesome. So I should get one now. 100. Let's turn off the lights and see how it looks in the dark. Very cool. Now, we haven't done the backlight. <laughs> Look, folks, it takes a while to do this stuff. We kept running into problems. We had to we had to figure out why the pop bumper thing wasn't right, which by the way, we had to figure out why that wasn't right. Then we had to figure out the swing and target thing. We had to clean all that stuff underneath the play field. We had to fix the left pop bumper light, which, by the way, uh, we had to fix the roto target, which, by the way, <laughs> right? We're getting there. It just it takes a while if you're going to do it right. I guess I could flip it one time. There it went. Straight down the drain. <laughs> All right. So uh, I think it it didn't count a ball against me because the same player shoots again. Uh, so we're getting there, but we're not there yet. So we got a little ways left to go. I'll do one more video. We got to put on the back glass. We've got to test all of the scoring for all of the players. There's a little issue with the cord. The cord been taped on. Uh, we have to put apron cards on it. We have to put the front on it. Have to put locks on it. And then fix whatever else breaks. So I hope you enjoyed it so far. That Roto Target is just awesome. What One of the coolest pinball inventions ever. That and the Drop Target are kind of like... The flipper, the roto target, and the drop target, I think, are my, my favorite three. The pop bumpers are really cool, too, but and slingshots are really cool. And that's about everything that was ever invented on a pinball machine that matters. But, <laughs> but I hope you liked the video so far, the series so far. Leave your comments below. Let us know what you think. Did you ever play Shipmates? This is the first time I've ever had one of these. It's a really good-looking game, though. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it so far. We'll see you on the next video where we'll get back into it. Is there a light bulb? I see a light bulb out. There we go. That makes it look better. Um, we'll get farther into it on the next video. I hope you enjoyed it so far. Don't forget to check out my brother Donnie. My brother has his own channel here on YouTube. It's called the My Brother Donnie channel. You can find a link to it down below. And uh, I'm over there with him on his channel a lot. Uh, on this channel, we do arcade games, pinball machines, and jukeboxes. On his channel, we do old buildings, old vehicles, things like that. So go check that out. I will see you over there, but I'll see you back in two days with hopefully, I've said this on the last video, but hopefully the conclusion of this shipmates.